My name is Mark Tatro, and I am the Kevin B. Harrington Student Ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for Stathis Kavala's talk on the Eurozone and Greek Tysis. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin Dr. Khalida's talk, I would like to remind you to turn off any cell phones or other devices that make noise. Tonight's speaker, Stathis Khalidis, is the Arnold Wolfers Professor of Political Science and the Director of the Program of Border, Conflict, and the Violence at Yale University. He got his BA from the University of Athens, his MA from the University of Chicago, as well as getting his PhD from the University of Chicago. Dr. Khalidis is the author of multiple books, including The Logic of Violence and Civil War, the Rise of Christian Democracy in Europe, and Modern Greece, What Everyone Needs to Know. He has won several awards for his writing, including the Wu Bear Award, the Woodrow Wilson Award, and the J. David Greenstone Award, among many others. Tonight, Dr. Kalibos will join us for a talk entitled, Reflections on the Eurozone and Greek Crisis. He will be discussing the recent Greek economic crisis and the effect that this had on surrounding countries in the Eurozone. Following Dr. Kalibos' remarks, we will have a brief question and answer period. Please wait until the student ambassador with the microphone reaches you before you begin answering your question. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stathis Kalidas. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great opportunity to visit uh, St. Anselm's College. I've never been here before. It was great. Um, to interact with students and faculty and meet uh, some people I actually knew from the University of Chicago. Uh, what I would like to do today is to try to summarize um, a lot of the uh, puzzling issues that have aris arisen in, in the context of the Greek crisis and the Eurozone crisis more generally. It's a very complex set of issues. I've tried to cram as much as possible, so I'm going perhaps to fly from some slides depending on how much time we have but it's an attempt to try to answer every question you may have in just one presentation. So the first, uh, just to give you the roadmap, the first question I'd like to address is why I really care about this issue. After all, Greece is a very small country, doesn't count for much, it's about 11 million population. Uh, I'd like to just give you a sense of how complex and multifaceted issue it is, and that's why I think it's also very fascinating. Um, then I'll propose a way to go about that by just giving you the basic facts uh, of uh, the Greek crisis in the Eurozone more generally, and then summarize most of what I think uh, it makes sense to actually try to know in 10 questions, and then try to fly through those questions as fast as I can. So it's a lot. Um, <coughs> why should we care uh, about the Greek crisis? Because the Greek crisis became, in a sense, the center, the epicenter of a much, much more important almost global crisis. Uh, a lot of people thought that Greece had the potential of becoming uh, the Lehman Brothers uh, of the global economy. And uh, the events in Greece created a tremendous amount of interest precisely because they had, uh, they created the possibility of uh, uh, creating a much more important crisis. I'm going to explain why. How is it possible that such, such a small country and such a, an insignificant economy can have this kind of effect? Um, I think it's also very interesting, I'll try to address some of those questions at the end, because the Greek crisis gives us a very nice angle from which to understand what kind of process is the European integration process. Where does it go, where is it going? Um, I think it's one of the most uh, interesting experiments of our time in trying to understand exactly how it is evolving um, is, is a very interesting question uh, of which there isn't a definite answer. Um, it also is an opportunity to try to think about the political economy of uh, a very big economic recession. What are the political effects of the economic crisis and vice versa? How, are how is the political fallout of economic crisis deepen uh, economic crisis? And, and, and how can we disentangle the economic from the political in these uh, processes in which the two overlap? So the basic timeline is as follows, uh, just to give you a very quick sense of the events. In 2008, we have the subprime crisis in the US, and this is really what gets the process rolling. Because the uh, recession in the US and the crisis is so important, a lot of uh, 
people who are involved in financial markets become uh, start to assess risk, financial risk, in a very different way. So that creates uh, a ripple effect. And in 2009, we have elections in Greece, and it is discovered that the size of the Greek deficit is much more important than it was anticipated. Because Greece is very much dependent on borrowing that creates panic in the financial markets, not just because of the dire financial situation in Greece, but because that is understood as being a weak, a weak link in the Eurozone, and in the, in the Euro currency, which is one of the most important ones. And that leads, in a sense, to Greece being shut out of the financial markets, unable to refinance its debt. As a result of that, and as a result of the potential of contagion, uh, the Eurozone had to come up with a plan to deal with the uh, impossibility of this refinancing, which led to the first bailout, whose size was incredibly large for uh, what was uh, at the time uh, uh, a very small economy. And, and more generally, the size of the first bailout was 110 billion euros, which is about, depending on the, uh, uh, on, on the relationship to the dollar, about 130, 140 million, billion dollars. So very, very large. The big uh, Argentina crisis in 2001 was much more smaller in terms of the size. The second bailout takes place in 2011, so the first one couldn't solve the problem. We have to go to the second one. Uh, then in 2012, there is a set of elections in which, for the first time, there is a perception that Greece may exit the euro, and that may cause uh, unknown uh, effects, it may have a very important but unclear impact uh, on the rest of the uh, European and global economy. And then in 2014, things look like they're going to stabilize, as we're going to see. And then in 2015, we have a new election, creating an even bigger uncertainty uh, that uh, peaks during the summer of 2015, just a few months ago, uh, with a very big concern about the fate of Greece, about the fate of the Eurozone, and leading to a third bailout, adding addition, an additional 85 billion to the Greek debt. So uh, that is in a very, very kind of small summary, the, the basic uh, points of that crisis. It is possible to illustrate um, the uh, situation um, using this uh, very simple chart that has two lines. The first one shows, um, the first one shows uh, here the, uh, the blue line is the uh, extent, the, the cost of the, the risk of the Greek debt is the distance between the yield of the bonds that are sold by the Greek government compared to the, uh, the price, the yield of the German bonds. So the highest the distance, uh, the more the risk, the more difficult the economic situation for Greece. So if you look at the timeline, the situation starts going out of control here in 2009, 2010. Really, the risk peaks in 2012, then goes down and peaks again. The red line, on the other hand, is the uh, level of deposits in the Greek banks. And what you can see here is that it stands at a very high level, about 200 uh, billion at the beginning of the crisis, and then it collapses in 2012. So you can see the direct correlation between the situation of the Greek banks on the one hand and uh, the, the situation of the risk of the Greek debt. Then it stabilizes for a period of two years, and then we see a new collapse in 2015. Uh, if we were to add the political events, this is the first election in 2009, which in a sense triggers the crisis in Greece, causing the first rise in the, Greek, in, in the uh, risk of the Greek debt. Uh, the Greek debt acquires a junk uh, status from the various rating agencies immediately after that. First bailout takes place in May 2010, then we have a new government, so the socialist government elected in 2009 phase. We have a new coalition government under a technocrat who negotiates a second bailout. And that leads then to uh, the second bailout that corresponds with a very high rise of the risk. A double election in May and June 2012, the second peak of, uh, of, the, of the big uh, risk. And then uh, after the situation stabilizes, in fact, we have elections in January of this year, 2015 which explain the deterioration of both the risk and the deposit situation. So that's uh, the timeline of those five years. And we see a very close interaction between political and economic variables, which I'm going to try to, uh, to explain to you. The 10 questions that I would like to address are the following ones. The first one, what kind of crisis are we talking when we talk about the Greek and Eurozone crisis? Uh, the second question is, 
which causes of the crisis are we talking about? It's related to the first one, but it's slightly different. The third one, what kind of solutions were proposed and applied and with what kind of effects, uh, which is the fourth question. The fifth question has to do with the question of debt, which has been uh, front and center of, of that crisis. The uh, sixth question is about the political dimension and the political effect and consequences, but also the impact of the crisis on the political side. I'm going to say then a few th brief things about the elections of 2015, which led to a radical leftist government taking power in Greece, followed by very complex um, and very um, episodic negotiations immediately after that, that lasted from January 2015 to July 2015. Then the referendum that was called in June, uh, and the final outcome uh, is going to be what follows uh, that referendum and those elections. So first question, what kind of crisis was the Greek crisis? Uh, it turns out it's not just a simple one crisis. It's a combination of many crises. And in a sense, one of the th things that makes this process very interesting, very difficult, and also very fascinating to study is the extent to which all those crises are connected to each other. And one of those crises triggers additional ones or additional cycles. At the very simple level, you can say that the Greek crisis started as a sovereign debt crisis. You have a sovereign, a state, that is unable to service its debts. So uh, it, it faces the prospect of a default. Uh, however, it turned out to be slightly more complicated than that. Uh, the reason why uh, the Greek state was unable to refinance its debt was because not only its debt was very high at this point, but it was also discovered that its deficit, the deficit that the Greek government was running, was very high and also unexpectedly high. It turns out that the Greek state had announced a much lower number. And when it was discovered that the actual deficit was higher, that created a panic in the markets. However, underneath that debt crisis, we also have a competitiveness crisis. It turns out Greece was importing much more uh, than it was able to export. And that created a balance of payment, a trade account kind of crisis, which had a very important consequences for restarting the Greek economy. And that was in turn connected with the Greek political institutions. One of the ways in which people described uh, the Greek state was that uh, uh, it did not correspond to the level of uh, development and the standard of life of the Greek society. In the sense, the Greek society enjoyed a much higher level uh, of standard of life than the quality of the Greek state um, guaranteed. Uh, however, the uh, crisis did not remain a Greek crisis. It spread uh, to the other countries of the European South, uh, initially to Portugal, uh, to Ireland. Eventually, it reached Spain. And there was a lot of concern in 2010 that the crisis may affect Italy and France, all of which had problems that, to some extent, were similar to the Greek uh, situation in the sense that a lot of those economies were heavily indebted and faced problems of competitiveness. Uh, and that led to an understanding of the crisis as, uh, as a problem of imbalance, of structural imbalance within the Eurozone. Very simply, you have, in a sense, an economy that is based on very strong economies in the North that generate a surplus, generate a lot of cash, and then this cash is moving to the South uh, lent at very low interest rates and generating very big credit bubbles, which were then expressed in a variety of different ways. In Greece, the credit bubble was expressed as a, as a problem of sovereign debt because the Greek state was borrowing a lot of money that it couldn't repay. But in Spain, the money was not borrowed by uh, the Spanish state. It was borrowed by real estate developers who then were uh, channeling this money into very cheap credit for uh, Spanish households creating a sort of real estate bubble that was not very different from the one in the United States prior to 2008. So there was a structural question, lots of cash flowing from north to south, the south being very vulnerable into borrowing this money, not using it well, and as a result, creating these kinds of problems. More generally, it was also a problem of contagion in the sense that a lot of Greek banks had lent money to the European states of the South. So if Greece and other states went bankrupt, the, Greek, the European banking system would collapse. And that was why a lot of people uh, used the uh, metaphor of uh, Greece as being a, a Lehman Brothers problem. And more generally, it highlighted the problem of design of the European common currency, the euro, which on the one hand was like the dollar in the sense many countries used the same uh, currency 
there was a central bank which was independent but had much less uh, capacity to intervene compared to the Fed, to the Federal Bank in the United States. And also, in spite of having a monetary uh, currency union, a European and have a fiscal union. So every state had its own budget and, it's a, and had an ability to run, in a sense, unmonitored um, a very large deficit that put it into a very put those states in a very difficult position. So the Eurozone, the reason the Eurozone was, in, in a sense, designed in this um, uh, problematic way was that at the time uh, when the Euro was adopted by many European countries, most of those states did not want to sacrifice their fiscal sovereignty. They wanted to have the benefits of a common currency without having the cost of having to, in a sense, uh, move away from a very significant part of their sovereignty by giving fiscal power to a central authority. So the uh, incomplete design of the Euro reflected the fact that European states wanted to move with integration because of its benefits, but didn't want to assume its costs. So you have to ask the question, why then did the euro happen given that kind of um, uh, trade-off? And the reason is because the people who were designing the euro understood that the only way to get sovereign states to sacrifice their sovereignty is, in a sense, not to tell them the truth, to push them in a situation in which they would face a crisis and would have to sacrifice their sovereignty not because they want to, but because the alternative was much worse. And the reason for that is because, by definition, sovereigns don't sacrifice their sovereignty. And that highlights, I think, the most important challenge of constructing, a, in a sense, a federal, quasi-federal unit of very distinct states that don't want to sacrifice their sovereignty. You can only do that surreptitiously, by deception, so to speak. You can push them in a situation in which, only by forcing them to sacrifice more sovereignty at every step, you are going to achieve the outcome. But of course, that's a very risky strategy. Uh, and it's a very risky strategy because at every big crisis, such as the one we've seen uh, in Europe in the last five years, you can have a collapse of the entire system. So in a sense, you are moving uh, in a situation in which the distance between a full collapse of the common currency and, and integration, the distance between the two is very, very small. And I think that makes the process very interesting to observe, precisely because it's so risky. What were the causes of, of the crisis? Well, the trigger, the initial trigger was global. It was the American, the US subprime crisis. But I think that if it wasn't that trigger, there would be another one, precisely because the system was designed in such a way uh, it would have, uh, in a sense, uh, fallen to another crisis if it wasn't the, uh, the uh, subprime crisis. And of course, it started in Greece because Greece was the weakest link in the Eurozone, the state with the most problems. And that's why it was first expressed there. And that's why, in a sense, it is still a problem in Greece when, in fact, it seems that the other countries uh, that suffered from the effects of, of the initial Greek crisis have grown out of it. Third question, what were the solutions to the problems of the crisis? Uh, so the initial uh, solution uh, was to create a sort of a package that uh, is very often described as a package of conditionality. In exchange for loans, uh, from uh, the Eurozone and the IMF, Greece had to uh, make some very difficult fiscal concessions. It would have, in a sense, to balance its books very quickly. Uh, this is what is called austerity. You have to increase your taxes, you have to decrease uh, your spending in order to be able to have this kind of balanced books. Uh, and obviously that creates a tremendous amount of economic pain, and some people argue it also makes growth very difficult because it creates a chain of various uh, effects. Um, there, was immediate, there was no immediate haircut. Many people argued that the best solution would have been to make the debt much more manageable at that initial stage, which didn't happen because there was no political way for that to happen. Uh, and uh, there was a very big problem with highly optimistic projections. The expectation of the IMF in 2010 was that Greece would return to growth by 2012. And it didn't, that didn't happen. Uh, something very different happened instead. That was often described as the problem of multipliers. Multipliers are basically the formulas used to uh, project uh, the economic costs of fiscal adjustments, uh, which were misunderstood in the Greek case. And there's a very big discussion about why the IMF got involved in a crisis in Europe. Uh, the basic uh, points, the basic uh, insights here are the first is the Eurozone wanted a policeman. 
they didn't trust their own institutions. The Europeans did not trust themselves to police uh, the countries that had, in a sense, deviated from the agreed on policy. And so the IMF was brought in as a policeman. The second explanation, which is complementary, is that the IMF at the time was run by Dominique Strauss-Kahn, a Frenchman who wanted to be the next president of France and thought that uh, involving the IMF into the European crisis would be a stepping stone for him. And then he got involved in a sex scandal and he was not heard from after that. Uh, but the IMF had to do a very big adjustment in its bylaws uh, in order to be able to, in a sense, participate in this very large project in Europe. And that leads the question of Brexit. That was a term that was coined uh, to um, describe the possibility of Greece exiting the Eurozone. Uh, it became a central uh, issue. I, I will tell you more about that. Um, a lot of people argued that both the Eurozone and Greece would be better off if Greece left, but that didn't happen for a number of reasons. Uh, a key point here is that very often a lot of people make the mistake uh, of assuming that the decision to join the Euro and the decision to leave the Euro are the same. So for example, if you read people like Paul Krugman and others, when they argue that Greece would be better off if it left the Eurozone, uh, they produce arguments uh, that are basically arguments explaining why Greece should have joined the Euro in the first place. The problem is, uh, to use a metaphor, that joining the Euro is like deciding to board a plane Leaving the euro is like deciding to leave a plane while the plane is flying. It's not the same decision, right? And so you have to distinguish that. And this is, I think, a point that very often is missed. Right? Once you are on that plane, no matter why you join in the first place, it's a very different kind of process, uh, and you have to think about that. Uh, all the programs in which the IMF gets involved have a strong conditionality, meaning a country agrees to get a loan and in exchange has to clean its act. Cleaning its act, as I said, is very costly and very painful. But that's the basic deal on which all these kinds of agreements uh, are constructed. Um, and the final point that I would like to make is that all of that was a policy innovation. At the time of the crisis, there were no tools in Europe and no institutions to manage this kind of event. So if we want, in a sense, to reach a first conclusion about all that story, is that the Eurozone innovates on the fly, in the shadow of the crisis. And that's the only way it can innovate. Otherwise, uh, when things are going well, no one has an incentive to move from the status quo. So by definition, the Eurozone has to uh, have crisis in order to move ahead. Uh, just to give you a sense uh, of the uh, effect of the Euro on Greece, it was incredibly positive initially. It was associated with high growth. I also want to highlight the fact that the introduction of, of the euro is associated very much like in the past, the peg of the Greek currency, the drachma to the dollar, with a very low inflation. So it had a very positive effect on the Greek economy, eliminated inflation. The second table basically tells you that even in the mid of the crisis in 2013, Greece was among the countries which were um, uh, among the wealthiest countries in the world. So even though the shock, the economic shock, as we're going to see, to Greece was very big, very high, uh, Greece remains a very wealthy country, comparatively speaking. And that is also another point that is very often missed. So the extent of the losses, the extent of the shock, does not mean that you suddenly become uh, very poor. Um, the extent, however, of the shock was very big, and it's highlighted by this chart. Uh, you can see that by 2014, Greece had lost about 24% of its GDP, which is uh, as much, almost as much, and probably is going to reach the same level as the US during the Great Depression. So it's a very, very steep economic shock in terms of uh, growth loss. Uh, and these final uh, charts uh, show you the comparison of the Greek recession to the Great Recession in the United States. Uh, in fact, Greece, the Greek recession is lasting, the depression actually is lasting longer than the American one. We don't have this kind of recovery that the United States had. And you can see here just the uh, extent of which the GDP uh, of Greece between 2000, uh, basically 8 and 2014 declined. So very, very steep economic cost. At the same time, you can say from with using a different metric that the uh, program was successful in Greece in at least two ways. It was successful in terms, not only just in Greece, but in the other countries. There was a fiscal rebalancing. So Greece was able to produce primary surpluses. The books became balanced. 
right? At a very painful, as I said, uh, level. And the second thing is that a very large number of reforms got implemented. Uh, even though the effects of those reforms, first of all, uh, is going to be uh, uh, realized in the long term, and also uh, you have to take into account that introducing reforms at a time of economic crisis affects uh, very much the effects of those reforms. So we have uh, uh, this Great Depression in Greece, uh, re keeping in mind that still Greece remains a wealthy country, and it's better off even after all those years compared to when it actually joined the euro. So its GDP per capita is slightly higher to when it actually joined the euro. So it lost all the gains it made uh, since joining the euro, but hasn't still, has fell uh, below that. Uh, the second thing that we have to keep in mind is what was the counterfactual? What was the alternative to Greece to this very painful fiscal adjustment? The only realistic counterfactual is that the, uh, the, the, the alternative would have been a default. And a default would have meant an immediate adjustment. So instead of having to go through this adjustment in five years, which was incredibly painful, Greece would have suffered this adjustment in one year, which would have been much faster, but five times more painful. So, and nobody can know exactly what the effects would have been of that. Uh, the second thing that you have to keep in mind is that here we have the first divergence between the countries of the South, very often referred by the acronyms as PIGs, uh, in which Greece performed much worse compared to the other countries that went through the same programs. Uh, and so the question is why uh, did Greece uh, performance, uh, was, was Greece performance so dismal uh, compared to the other countries? There are a number of explanations here. Uh, people emphasize very much austerity, but beyond austerity you have uh, some uh, fundamental structural distortions of the Greek economy. Uh, and also the effect of political uh, developments, which were the results of the uh, economic depression, and also the political uncertainty of Greece being expected to leave the euro, which created secondary effects, which were, in a sense, additionally difficult to contain. And so when you think about what Greece needed to do in 2009, it was not just adjust its fiscal books, clean up its books. It had to reconstruct its economy. And on top of that, it had to re overhaul its institutions, political institutions, and its, and its public sector. In a sense, what Greece needed to do was uh, initiate a state building pro program, which is very difficult to do anyway, and it's even more difficult to do under conditions of economic emergency. Uh, that leads us to the question of the debt. If you look uh, at the debt, uh, instead of being reduced, as a result of those bailouts and of the haircut that happened in 2011, it has increased. There is a very simple explanation for this paradoxical fact, which is that GDP is always measured as a proportion of your uh, debt is measured as a proportion of your GDP. So when your GDP goes down, no matter how down your debt goes in uh, absolute value, it actually goes up in relative value. Uh, the second thing to keep in mind, uh, however, is that uh, in terms of its uh, repayment uh, schedule, Greece doesn't face uh, the same kind of servicing debt that other countries do face. In fact, the servicing costs of the Greek debt for Greece are smaller than the servicing costs of Germany. And that's a detail that not many people know. So there is a very big discussion these days about uh, debt, uh, whether it's sustainable or not. Uh, but I think uh, there is an aspect of that question which is a bit of a red herring, uh, which is that uh, when we think about uh, uh, the uh, debt as a stock versus debt as uh, refinancing, there is a difference. Greece owes a tremendous amount of money, but it owes, it has two characteristics. The first one is the money it sold to the publics uh, of uh, its Eurozone partners, to other states and other financial institutions of the Eurozone rather than to uh, private investors. The second thing is that the um, interest rates that Greece pays on its debt and the maturities uh, of its debt are both very low and very long, which means that servicing that very enormous debt is actually not very costly, which are, is going to have a very important effect in how we understand what the debt means for, for Greece, which is also an element that is lost in the conversation, the discussion. Very often when, for example, economists discuss the problem of the Greek debt, 
they tend to assume that it's a similar debt than every other state's sovereign debt, which is owned to private investors at market cost. The problem with the Greek uh, and the advantage of the Greek debt is that because of a number of uh, institutional innovations in Europe, it means that Greece is basically able to borrow and refinance that debt at very low, uh, at very low rates, which means that if it sets its economy right, it will be able, in a sense, to face this mountain of debt under better conditions than normally. The second thing is, you are not likely to see an explicit haircut. Because an explicit haircut of the Greek debt means that uh, a number of European countries will have to tell their taxpayers that they're giving money away which their taxpayers will never accept. What instead you're likely to get is a very long, uh, uh, in a sense, spreading of its servicing the extension of the maturities and even more lowering of the interest rates. So what that means, in a sense, is that there is a sort of indirect mutualization of the Greek debt happening. That means that the European taxpayers are assuming the cost of the Greek debt without knowing they are doing so. And that's the second effect that's very important to emphasize. A lot of what is going on in Europe, and another way to understand the European integration process is to understand that many things are happening from the back door. Why? Because they would be unacceptably, unacceptable politically if they were to happen from the front door, which raises a number of issues, which I'm going to address at the end. The sixth question is what kind of politics? Because the shock was so big and so unexpected, nobody in 2009 expected in Greece that the country was going to face this problem, the Greek, political, the Greek party system collapsed. Uh, what you can see here is that the proportion of the two big parties that hovered around 80% up to 2009 collapsed. So the two main parties that used to dominate the Greek party system, uh, one of them basically disappeared, and the other has become a much weaker party than it used to be. So imagine uh, the American party system without the Democrats and the Republicans, with the Democrats vanishing and the Republicans becoming a weak party. That's what happened in Greece, so an enormous political shock. Uh, and that is another divergence. Uh, only uh, Greece was uh, uh, the only European country in which the shock of uh, the economic adjustment was so big to cause uh, this uh, tremendous political effect. We haven't seen uh, similar effects uh, in Portugal, in Spain, or in Ireland, even though there were some political fallout. Was it because of the size of the depression? In part. It was also in part because of pre-existing problems in the Greek party system. That is, to put it in a very simple way, the two Greek parties had based their success on a system known as clientelism, in which they provided a lot of favors, especially jobs, in the public sector to the electorate, and in exchange got their votes. Once they were unable to provide those goodies, they lost uh, the trust and the uh, support of uh, the population, of the electorate. So in a sense, there was a pre-existing weak spot in the Greek system that explains the divergence on top of the Great Recession. Uh, on top of it, this clientelistic system was built uh, in, on, a, on a sort of populist base, meaning that the language that was used to explain how the system worked was a language that, in a sense, uh, emphasized the benefits for the people, not the benefits, of course, for individual voters, in a sense, proceeding in this kind of quid pro quo exchange. So a lot of people thought, when they lost those benefits, that it was not just a bad system that collapsed, but uh, in fact, that a good system collapsed. Um, very often, I think that the comparison between Greece uh, in this situation uh, uh, would be called with uh, the countries that went through the post-communist transition with the difference being that uh, uh, during the period of, uh, in which Greece was ruled under the clientelist system, most people uh, were actually much better off. Whereas in most communist countries, people were very poor, so they accepted, in a sense, the cost of the transition with the hope that the uh, economy would improve. Not so in Greece. Uh, that gives you a sense of, of uh, how uh, the parties uh, behaved. But the difference, the big uh, change happened in 2012 when the Socialist Party went from almost 45% to 13%. And here is the other very big change. A very small party of the extreme left, the coalition of the radical left, that used to get about 4 to 5%, became the second strongest party 
at acquired 16%, and so it became the alternative poll. And it did so on a program that was based on a full-fledged critique of the austerity program, arguing that there was an alternative policy that would allow Greece to do much better, suffer much less pain, and at the same time remain in the euro, keeping the benefits of the euro, not moving out of it. Uh, and that led, in a sense, to a new political system. Uh, if you look at the results of the January 2015 elections that, in a sense, uh, completed that change, uh, this very small party of the radical left became the strongest party of the country, obtaining 36.5% of the vote, the first party, of the, uh, the first uh, and, and the strongest party. Imagine, um, to give you a sense of the comparison, a marginal party in the United States suddenly becoming the strongest party in a matter of two years. So it was a complete political earthquake. What kind of radical left was that party, however? And how can we understand it when we s sort of say radical left, we imagine revolutionaries flooding the streets. Was that the case? Uh, so the Greek acronym of the party is Syriza. It turns out that uh, domestically it was not as revolutionary as people thought. What the party did, in fact, was promise to the Greek electorate that they could return to the good old days uh, of the pre-crisis, in a sense, re-establishing through some sort of magic a system through which people would do much better without having to, in a sense, take uh, all these difficult decisions that were implied by reconstructing the economy. And it was a very interesting development that happened because the radical left didn't have enough votes in the parliament to create, to lead to, a, to, to its own government. It needed to ally with another party. It allied not with the central left parties that were closest to it on the left to right axis, but it allied with the radical right wing party. So in a sense, we saw a coalition of the two extremes, which makes very difficult sense. It's not easy to explain and understand. Uh, the only explanation is that those two parties were both very, very big critics of austerity and also had an agenda of somehow returning to the good days uh, of economic prosperity, but without the necessary adjustments. And to understand that, you have to understand the voters who voted for those parties, who very often were former voters especially of the old Socialist Party. Uh, and in a sense, what this, uh, the, the radical left was, was a, an overhaul of the populist legacy of the 1980s in Greece. Um, I can tell you more about that, but I think a very nice analogy would be Argentina, in which you have a similar type of populist called Peronism that works pretty much in the same way. Eighth question is, when the radical left came to power, they had to actually deliver they had promised an end of austerity. So what were they were going to do? They had, in a sense, to get a better deal from Greece's creditors. Uh, and I think that's the best way that describes the strategy, the negotiating strategy of the new Greek government, uh, which, in a sense, was uh, uh, causing wounds to the country itself as a, as a way to blackmail uh, a better deal. Uh, the situation became very quickly a cliffhanger. Uh, many people thought that uh, we were going to observe uh, a collapse of the European currency with unknown effects. Uh, however, that didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen, uh, I think, is explained by this very simple chart that shows, again, the yield of the Greek uh, government bonds compared to the other ones of the countries at risk in the European South. What you see here is that uh, with the election of the radical left, the Greek risk became very high, but not the risk for the other southern European countries. So suddenly Greece, which was basically hoping to create a crisis of contagion that would force the creditor countries to give better terms on its debt, found itself alone. It couldn't cause the sort of effect it had expected. And the reason it couldn't cause that effect was the other countries were actually you know, looking as if they were getting out of the very difficult situation they had been in. They had taken the bitter medicine, and they had some good results to show off. As a result, the financial markets, unlike in 2010, didn't associate what was happening in Greece with what was happening in the rest of Europe. And that was a very big difference that essentially wrecked the Greek negotiating strategy from the get-go. So the goal of getting better creditors, better terms of the from Greece's creditors didn't actually, was not realized. And as a result, the whole strategy of Greece, which was basically 
the strategy of a suicide bomber who threatens to kill uh, himself or herself and kill everyone around them was not credible. Greece, in a sense, was becoming a suicide bomber who only killed themselves and nobody else. And as a result, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of, of this uh, negotiation led to a tremendous, amounted to a tremendous miscalculation. And when it became clear to the Greek government that the Eurozone was not going to fall, they faced a very difficult situation. They had to explain to their electorate how you know, they were going to give them something very different from what they had promised. And the only way out at that point seemed to be a sort of poker kind of coup decision by the Greek Prime Minister last June, which was to call a referendum. Uh, and that became the pinnacle of the Greek crisis. So the referendum was called uh, in June. And what is very interesting, uh, there was uh, a, a basically a choice that was given to the Greek electorate, whether to accept the deal that was offered, that was on the table, by uh, Greece's creditors or to reject it. Basically, the choice is, do you want pay or do you want to refuse pay? And of course, uh, it was very difficult to explain in a credible way what the consequences of those decisions were. Because the referendum, in fact, was taking place just in one week. From the moment the decision to call a referendum was announced, to the moment it was going to take place, there was only one week for deliberations. So nobody knew exactly uh, what was being asked. So the whole question uh, revolved around the question of framing. Making, uh, in a sense, uh, claiming that the referendum meant something as opposed to something else. There were two positions. One position was that if Greece, if the Greek voters rejected the deal that was offered, Greece would have to exit with very terrible consequences for the Greek people for a number of reasons. And the other argument was that no, that was not the case. Greece would actually could have gotten better terms. So the majority of the government argued that with the rejection of the present deal, a better deal would be possible. The majority of people, about 60%, bought this kind of story. And as a result, the Greek electorate rejected the deal that had been on the table. What did that mean, however? Nobody knew exactly what was going to follow the day after. Was Greece going to uh, exit? the euro or not. Uh, that led to a, an incredible U-turn. Immediately after the government got the Greek people to reject the deal that was offered by the creditors, it made a U-turn and accepted terms that were much worse than the ones it had rejected. Now, you would think, and I think that's the most interesting part of the story, that a government that basically is shown to have promised something that was impossible is forced to make a U-turn and is not only forced to make a U-turn, but is forced to accept conditions that are much worse from the ones it got the people to reject, you would expect this government to be punished in the elections. So the, the government called new elections. Not only it was not punished, but it won them. So the same people who voted to exit or you know, to reject the deal, in a sense, voted back in power a government that had failed to deliver, and in fact delivered something that was much worse and caused a tremendous damage in the economy because as a result of the call to the referendum, Greece was uh, forced to introduce capital controls to close its banks because people were getting their money out. So how to explain this incredible contradiction? How to explain this inconsistent kind of behavior? Um, one thing that we can say is that the Greek vote of September 2015 is an example of uh, why people do not always vote retrospectively in narrow economic terms. Uh, this, now the, the studies we have indicate that two factors were important. First of all, a lot of voters felt there was no other alternative. After all, they had elected the government back in January and they were not ready to revise uh, their opinion of that government so fast. So they were willing to give a second chance to a government that had failed to deliver. And the second reason is so the other parties were not credible, the alternatives. And the second reason is the government managed to sell its failure as an effort. Even though we failed, we tried. And so you have at least not to penalize us for having tried to get a better deal, uh, which was uh, an incredibly successful feat of political communication to convince people that even though the results you brought were terrible, at least you tried and you should be thanked for having tried.
Uh, and that, I think, these are the two arguments that explain uh, this outcome. Just to give you a sense of the evolution of the Greek economy throughout this process, I have created this graph which uses two, uh, uh, has two indicators. The, uh, the first one is the, the survey of economic sentiments of the people. And the second one is the so-called PMI index that measures the expectations uh, of uh, managers in the manufacturing sector about how their companies are going to order uh, in the next couple of months, which is a very good indicator about what people in the real economy expect the economy to do. So you can get the entire story of the Greek crisis in those two charts, if you, and, and they sort of match each other. So what you can see is that an initial collapse of the economic sentiments and expectations when the crisis started, with the uh, worst moment coming in 2012 during the two elections that took place then, and that tells you how political factors interact with economic factors to create uncertainty and produce additional hits on the economy. And then you can see that the situation stabilizes and improves. So we have two years of improvement after the most painful medicine was taken. But because elections had to be called again, we have a politically induced, in effect, uh, worsening of the economy as seen by the two indicators at a uh, level never before seen. So what I want to argue is that you cannot explain the effects of the crisis just by looking at the origins of the crisis. You have to understand how <coughs> politics, in a sense, m can make things worse once introduced into this process. And in fact, the second uh, collapse here is due exclusively to political factors much more to, than to economic factors. And I think that is one of the very big differences uh, between Greece and other countries. So things like the timing of elections uh, and um, the political agenda can have these uh, very big effects. I'm going to conclude uh, with two things. First of all, what are the prospects for Greece and what do these things mean for Europe? Uh, Greece has three paths. The first one is the present government having had to make the U-turn could do what is known as a Nixon in China strategy. That is, adopt and own its U-turn, try to pass the most painful measures immediately, and then work very hard to make the reforms work, and then get the rebound, get the benefit of a possible economic rebound. Uh, and very often people argue that leftist governments are much better at introducing painful reforms because they have a better kind of um, social profile, very much like President Nixon would be the only American politician to, uh, in a sense, visit Mao Zedong and communist China. The second path is the Greek government failing to do that kind of complete U-turn and a situation becoming stagnant, Greece remaining in the Eurozone, but not doing better. So in a sense, Greece becomes a sort of zombie country uh, in which nothing really moves uh, and improves, but the country not collapsing either because it's protected uh, by the Eurozone. And the third, of course, is a new sort of moment of crisis, the third one after 2012, 2015, which if it happens, it's going to produce an exit of Greece. Uh, nobody knows exactly what would that, that would entail uh, for Greece. Certainly there is an understanding that Greece living in the Eurozone at that point wouldn't hurt the Euro because most of the financial markets understand now Greece to be a very idiosyncratic and unique case and therefore not a contagious one. Uh, but it's not clear what would that, that would mean for Greece. Some economists argue that it's better for Greece to leave the Euro because it can devalue and become more competitive. However, if you look at its economy, uh, I'm very skeptical about this claim because I don't see, first, how past devaluations have worked for Greece, and second, I don't see these sort of economic reforms that are necessary to turn devaluation into a positive economic measure. Uh, so these are the three options, and I cannot tell you which one is going to happen. What about Europe? Uh, what about implications of the crisis for things like democracy, legitimacy of the European project, and integration? Uh, here I'd like to make a number of points. The first one is that people very often interpret the contradictions of the European project as being a weakness. And I have a counter uh, argument to that. In my opinion, the contradictions of the European project are its strength, not its weakness. What do I mean by that? I mean 
by that, that if you look in, the, in, in human history about how countries have integrated, how bigger entities have emerged out of smaller ones, you are going to have to find that the main way through which uh, that kind of thing was achieved was through war. So the only thing to achieve, the, the one way to achieve, in a sense, an integration without war is, I think, through this project, uh, through this process in which crisis creates a situation in which the alternative to sacrificing sovereignty, as I said in the beginning, is much worse. The second kind of issue that, uh, so the crises are going to be the engines of European integration by necessity. But that doesn't mean that the crises are always going to have a positive effect. There is always a very high risk associated with crisis. The second issue is uh, understanding uh, democracy. What does democracy mean in the context of European integration? So the Greek voters, for example, voted to reject a number of economic measures. And immediately they had to eat their decision and do exactly the opposite of what they had decided. So some people argue, you know, that is not democracy. However, the problem is that the European uh, entity right now is a hybrid entity. It is democratic at the national level, but it's not democratic at the intergovernmental level. What you have is 18, 19 different governments, each of which <coughs> make decisions democratically, but have to, ar have to arrive at a consensus at the level uh, of uh, the states themselves. So you have, in a sense, an entity that looks like democracies in different states, but also the UN at the top, which makes it very cumbersome. But again, that's the only uh, way in which this hybrid entity can work. And it has a lot of uh, implications uh, for how people understand that. Uh, there is a very big tension between democracy and sovereignty. Uh, because uh, sacrificing more sovereignty is the only way to get more democracy, presumably at a higher level. Once you create a common fiscal entity, then you can think of ways in which you can make this entity democratically accountable. But it's not easy to do, and it's very much a problem of chicken and egg, what is going to come first. Uh, and a lot of people think that uh, there is a loss. I mean, all this crisis during the summer created a lot of bitterness and a lot of the positive vision of Europe was lost, which is true. At the same time, uh, there, there are some very interesting effects that people have not emphasized as much. The first one is that uh, the Greek crisis reinforced the euro through the creation of new institutions that would have been impossible to imagine a few years back, that now exist. For example, uh, the European Stability Mechanism or the, the process of a uh, banking union in which all the banks are controlled by the same supervisory entity. It's not complete and it's an ongoing process, but it's much more integrated and advanced compared to what